The Lord be with you, and warmly I welcome you to Trinity Lutheran Church and School. God's blessings to all of you. Uh, some uh, maybe are visitors, and we're really pleased to have you joining us on this Saturday evening for worship. Uh, it's the eve of the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Let me make just a little note about um, kind of a scheduling thing that's in the bulletin. Uh, we do not have communion tonight, and I think the calendar that you'll find in your bulletin says that we don't have communion next Saturday either. Well, that's not correct. Uh, we do have communion on Saturday the 31st. So uh, make plans uh, certainly for that. Uh, I've been away for a couple weeks. I thank Pastor Francis and President Saunders for filling in for me while I was away. And it's good to be back with you. Uh, uh, we're looking forward this fall to kicking off faith families. You know, COVID really interrupted a lot of things, but thankfully things are getting back to normal. One of those is faith families, which is our small group uh, Bible studies. I will be deciding on our topic for the year. And as the bulletin notes, if you're interested in leading a group, please contact the church office. I'd also like to make mention of a new group, a men's Lutheran witness uh, morning reading and discussion time. So uh, it does not include breakfast. Frequently churches have men's breakfasts. No, don't come expecting that. Sorry, I'm not cooking you any breakfast. But we're going to start this Tuesday, and it'll be at 7 o'clock. And you know the magazine, The Lutheran Witness, excellent magazine. We're actually going to reach back at least a year and read an article called A Gift for Our Children, The Past, Present, and Future 
of Lutheran schools in America. It's kind of a history uh, a summary. And that's what we'll talk. We'll read through that and we'll talk about that. You're welcome to come. Uh, any of our men, 7 o'clock, Tuesday morning. Also Tuesday, there's a potluck picnic at Ellis Park. It's sponsored by the Faith, Friends, Fun, and Fellowship Group. It's a new group here at Trinity. You can read more about that in the, uh, in the bulletin. And then regarding a home missionary, LWML, bake and produce sale, I want to make a little announcement. Listen up. There is some fresh produce available ahead of the planned LWML bake and produce sale that is in two weeks. This uh, fresh produce is in the basement. I, I guess right now, I don't know, has anybody been down there to verify that? I, maybe it applies to tomorrow morning. So, uh, but it's in the basement either now or tomorrow morning. A free will donation to support LWML is appreciated. Items available are green beans, cabbages, beets, and lots of zucchini. And by the way, that bake and produce sale is going to be the 7th and 8th of August, Saturday and Sunday. Once again, a little error in the bulletin with those dates. It's the 7th and 8th of August, uh, Saturday after the evening service, two weeks from today, and Sunday after the morning service. Are there any other leaders who may have an announcement to share? Then please turn to our opening hymn, Rise My Soul, to Watch and Pray. It's number 663, and I invite you to stand.
Please turn in the four part of your hymnal to Divine Service Setting to page 167. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our worship continues with the introit. In your bulletin, you will find the introit on page 3. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, I will extol you, my God and King. Every day I will bless you. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. On the glorious splendor of your majesty. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, For the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in you, strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost is from Genesis chapter 9. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. 
And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Boys and girls, I invite you to come forward for a children's message. All right. Well, whether you're seated here or whether you're out there and whether you're a child or whether you're a grown-up, a little message um, from God's Word for you all. So first I want to ask you guys a question. Do you guys like sports? Raise your hand if you like sports even a little bit. Okay, you do. Yeah, I like sports too. Do you know that the world's greatest um, athletes are competing right now in a country called Japan, in the city of Tokyo, in a special contest. You guys know what that contest is called? It goes on for many days. So it starts with an O. Yeah. Good, yeah, the Olympics. When I was a boy, I was really interested in sports like you guys. I was especially interested in track and field, and I really loved when the Olympics would come on, which of course is only every four years. At that time, I knew by heart some of what they call world records. That means the greatest or uh, most, um, something that nobody's ever done better than that is called a world record. So I knew that in the long jump, a man named Bob Beeman in 1968 startled everybody by jumping 29 feet, two and a half inches, and for over 20 years, nobody ever jumped any farther than that. Eventually they did. When I was a kid, I could tell you about the world record in the clean and jerk. That's a kind of weightlifting contest. And I don't know exactly what it was anymore, but I know it was well over 500 pounds that somebody could lift over their head. Now there's a book that has in it all these world records. Maybe you guys have heard of this book before? The Guinness Book of World Records. You guys ever heard of it? Well. It's, um, it's a book you might look at sometime because it's, it's very interesting and it tells you all the amazing and awesome things that people have done. So guys, I got a question for you. What do you think is more amazing and awesome? Th great things that people have done or great things that God has done? What's more awesome or amazing or wonderful? You got the right answer. What God has done is more amazing and wonderful. You know, as I've grown older, I've actually become less interested in and less impressed with the things that people have done and more interested and impressed with the things that God has done. People may be able to do some pretty great things like jump almost 30 feet or lift almost 600 pounds over their head. But the truth is we are all still sinful people by nature, as we just confessed a moment ago, and we all have to die. But God, on the other hand, is perfect and almighty. Who can tell me the name of the book that tells us not really the world records, but the great things that God has done? Yeah. Yep. The Holy Bible. This book is greater than the Guinness Book of World Records because what it talks about is greater than the things that that book talks about. It talks about the great God, the true God, the only God, and all the wonderful things that he has done. I want to talk to you just for a minute about a little verse that comes from the Bible in today's what we call the introit from Psalm 145. And it says, on your wondrous works, I will meditate. On your wondrous works, I will meditate. Can you say that with me? On your wondrous works, I will meditate. Works are things that God has done. Wondrous means they're wonderful and amazing. They're big. They're great. Meditate. You guys know what that means? Hmm? Okay, meditating means to think quietly about something and to think about it very carefully and quietly. And the Bible tells us to meditate on God's works. In our Bible readings today, we heard about some of those works. Several thousand years ago, God sent water, rain, for 40 days and 40 nights. A flood that covered everything. And it destroyed all the things that breathed the air. 
including people, but it didn't destroy all the people, right? Nor did it destroy all the animals. So where were they? The ones who got kept safe and live? In the ark, exactly. So we also heard today in the Bible about Jesus and how last week we heard that he fed the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And today we heard about how he walked where people don't, aren't supposed to walk. What was that? Did you catch it? No? He walked on the water. And then he made the wind be calm. And after that, he healed lots of people. In fact, the Bible says that just by touching the edge of his clothes, the people who were sick became well. And they were better again. These are things that only God could do. What do you guys think that God could do for you? I want to tell you in one of today's Bible readings, Ephesians chapter 3, it says God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. You can't even think of how great God's power is for you to help you, provide for you, save you. And so the greatest thing God has done, of course, is coming among us as a human being, Jesus Christ, and going to the cross to die for our sins, to be punished in our place. That shows the great love that Christ has for us. And that's better than any Guinness world record in that whole book by far. And then having died and buried in the tomb, Jesus lived again, and that's great as well. He lived, uh, died, and then he lived again. It's called his resurrection. But I want to finally talk to you guys about baptism. Because when each of you was baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that was super awesome and wonderful. Because as our catechism connection this week says, and that's that little green sheet uh, that's in your bulletin, Baptism works forgiveness of sins, it rescues from death and the devil, and it gives eternal salvation to all who believe this, as the words and promises of God declare. So you have that forgiveness and rescue and salvation that, gave, that God gave you in baptism for Jesus' sake. And all of us who believe God's promises have that rescue, forgiveness, and salvation. So God's wondrous works and meditating or thinking about them, not only today here while we're in church, but at all through the week to come and day by day, you can meditate on the wondrous works of God. Would you fold your hands and let us pray together? Please say these words after me, guys. Dear God, I praise you for your wondrous works. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Thank you for coming up. We'll join in singing hymn 754.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the portion of scripture that's the basis for the sermon is Genesis 9, today's Old Testament reading. Did you ever wish that God would give you a sign? A sign to help you know how to make a hard decision. A sign to let you know what's going to happen in the future. Or a sign just to assure you that he is real. Did you ever wish that God would make his sign really plain, big, and bold, painted across the sky so you couldn't miss it? Well, this is what God has, in fact, done with the rainbow. The rainbow is a sign from God, and that's what we want to talk about tonight. I do not know anyone who doesn't like rainbows. The sight of a rainbow makes me Ooh and ah, maybe you out loud as well. Rainbows are beautiful. While we can predict the sort of conditions which will make a rainbow likely, we can't any of us produce a rainbow. They appear when they want to, it seems, out of our control. Rainbows have been seen in art for, I'm sure, a long, long time. People have also tended to make the rainbow into a symbol. For example, of striking it rich. I can think of state lotteries that have like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Somewhere along the line, the homosexual movement adopted the rainbow as an emblem of their cause. But all of this misses the mark of what the rainbow really means. The rainbow is far more than just a beautiful natural occurrence. And the rainbow is not to be seized and usurped for man's purposes and agendas. We learn from Holy Scripture that the rainbow is, in fact, not man's rainbow at all, but God's rainbow. The Word of God teaches that the rainbow is God's express sign to mankind and to all living things, a visible reminder of God's covenant promise to His creation. I was once in a church that had a stained glass window with a rainbow in it. Maybe you've been in one. And the particular window that I'm thinking of illustrates what I'm talking about here. See, the window shows a rainbow, and it also shows the back of a person whose hands are holding a book. The book I take to be the Bible, right? And the message we can draw from this stained glass window is that the Bible faithfully interprets for us the meaning of the rainbow. God himself, through his word, tells us what his rainbow means. Consider, several thousand years ago, as Genesis teaches us, God observed how the people on earth were full of hate and violence. They didn't believe in God or fear Him, and they lived in ways that were wicked. They were corrupt through and through. They didn't really care or want to change their ways. God, seeing this, was very sad. He was sorry to see what His human creatures were like. But Noah feared God and wanted to please God. Noah was sorry about his own sins, and he was grateful and he was glad for God's forgiveness. In faith, Noah walked with God, the Bible says. And God spoke to his man Noah and told him that he was going to send a flood on the earth to destroy everything that had the breath of life, man and beast alike. And Noah was instructed by God to build an ark, a great boat. I mean, a big boat, which would be the haven of safety for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and not only them, also a pair of all the animals. And for a long period of time, the carpenter was busy. And I imagine the people who watched him, the onlookers, laughed at him because they didn't believe that God was about to send a great flood. But in due time, God did just that. He poured out rainwater down upon the earth continually 40 long days and nights. With Noah and his family and the animals safe in the ark, the rest of the living creatures on earth, yes, all the people too, perished. Even the birds as they flew about eventually found no place to set down their feet because even the tops of the mountains were covered. So even the birds died just as God had said. Now, because this event, the worldwide flood, happened so long ago, before any of us were alive, we don't usually think about it. How often do you think about a flood having covered the whole earth? 
Many people don't believe it even happened, but it did. And whatever we think about it, or however we may not think about it, the great flood of Noah's day is still the reminder of what? It's the reminder that God's judgment is real. It's not a fiction. God will certainly not excuse those who persistently reject him. But the Bible tells us also the end of the story of the flood, that God did not abandon his man Noah or his family and the animals on the ark. God remembered Noah in love and mercy. And he caused all the great waters gradually to recede. It took many months until finally the ark came to rest, we are told, on the mountains of Ararat. Eventually, with the earth dried out, Noah and his family could go out from the ark. Can you imagine what that was like for them? We can't imagine it. But it must have been the most profound experience. On one hand, they had experienced God's wrath. But on the other hand, powerfully, they had experienced his patience and mercy and kindness toward them. Because here they were, still alive. All because God had warned them ahead of time about the flood. And then, then there came something else from God, as we heard in our text, and that was a post-flood promise. God affirmed to Noah and his sons that he was establishing his covenant with them and with their descendants, and indeed with every living creature on the earth, and God's covenant was his sincere pledge and promise that the world had seen the last of a worldwide devastating flood to destroy all living things. God assured them it wouldn't happen again. Do you suppose such a, com- such a promise was comforting to them? Indeed, it made their hearts glad. But God, as he often does, um, had more for them than just the word of the promise. He also had a sign. And he added his sign to his words. He spread before Noah's eyes a beautiful sight, which God said was the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. And the sign, of course, was the rainbow. And marvelously, God called it his rainbow. He would cause his rainbow to appear and to be seen amidst the clouds And when that happened, not only would people admire the rainbow in the sky, but God from above would see and he would remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And that is still happening in 2021. God is still laying rainbows before our eyes. And with each rainbow, he is still recalling and upholding his ancient promise. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Maybe people in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, have a little bit harder time with that one than others. But you made it through the flood of 13 years ago by God's grace, and it was no worldwide flood, though its severity certainly should not be diminished. But his promise was never to repeat what he did at that time in the days of Noah. And so what do we have here? We are tutored by the Bible in the correct and beneficial way of viewing a rainbow. It's not just a lovely sight, though it is that, nor is it some image that we may bend to our sometimes perverse purposes. Rather, the rainbow is a message from God if we only pay attention. And it's a message of mercy, which should lead us all to reverent gratitude before God. I've heard it said that in days gone by, children were taught to say the Lord's Prayer at the sight of a rainbow. Anybody ever heard of that? And I can see why this would be. In seeing a rainbow, you're reminded about God, that he's good and kind, and that he's merciful and gracious. Even though people, including us, still sin and fall short of the glory of God, yet God, in his mercy, spares us. And he daily calls us to repent and turn again to him from whom we receive forgiveness. He gives us time to turn from our ways. And sometimes with stubborn people like us, it takes a while. And God is so patient with you and me. He gives us time to turn from our ways to learn the wonderful way of his salvation. And so the sight of a rainbow, yes, it leads us 
to pray to our dear Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, in humble faith and thanksgiving. Now be assured, God does have another day of judgment in store for this world. It will be the last judgment, and it won't be by water, but it will be by fire, as the Bible tells us in 2 Peter. But the remarkable thing, what displays God's patience and love so clearly is that God has for ages and ages delayed this final judgment. He has caused human beings to live under the canopy of his rainbow of grace these countless generations. That canopy of grace is firmly in place for you also. For according to a promise that is even more ancient than the promise given to Noah and his family, God in his amazing grace sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, at the right time to bruise the head of the serpent, Satan, by dying on the cross and rising again. Some people have observed um, in the rainbow, the colors of the rainbow, the blue of the rainbow, can remind us of the water of the flood long ago, by which all living things on earth were wiped out. And some people have said that the red of the rainbow in the sky can remind us of the judgment by fire to come upon the earth on the last day, a warning for us to repent now. But that red of the rainbow, my friends, can it not also, also wonderfully remind us of the blood that cleanses us from all our many sins, that, that is the blood of God's own Son, Jesus Christ, which he shed willingly in love for us. Yes, it can. Let it remind you of that. All those who trust in Christ are saved from God's wrath, and they abide forever under his mercy and grace. We are given grace, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. You know, some people have also noted that God did not give his final sign of mercy and love when he gave the rainbow. God has given to his church other signs, visible, tangible things, which God has connected with his word of promise. As the rainbow teaches us that God is patient and wants to save those who come to him, so these signs also teach us that God is gracious and forgiving toward sinners. These signs I'm talking about are the holy sacraments. And I want to suggest to you that Trinity Lutheran Church's chancel windows depict them, albeit not directly, but abstractly. I see references. Consider, first of all, the blue portion of those two shields on the left and on the right window. Blue makes us think of what? Water, and the water makes us think of holy baptism. Truly, very um, unimpressive to the eye, but we don't measure as Christians God's works always by how impressive they are to the eye, but what he promises through them. Holy baptism, the Bible says, is the washing that comes from Christ and cleanses us inwardly from sin. It brings us into fellowship with God as redeemed, trusting children of God. So when you see and when you feel and when you're aware of your sin, and when you know your guilt and when you feel ashamed, and when it, when it all weighs heavy on your heart, God has a word for you. He says, remember, I took you as my child in holy baptism. You are mine. You are. I surely forgive you, for my own son has died and risen for you. So the water of baptism, the blue in those windows, is a sign of God's mercy to you. Now the two shields in the chancel windows aren't only blue, are they? Besides, they also have red sections. And red, again, makes us think of blood. The blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross, and moreover, given to Christians to drink in and with and under the wine of his holy supper. Take, drink, says your Lord and Savior. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. In this way, by this sign, Jesus assures us who are troubled and distressed 
that he has paid for our sins. And he wants us to drink and to believe and to be glad. The wine of communion, which is Christ's blood, is a sign of God's mercy toward you. Along with the bread, which is Christ's body, it teaches you to believe that God is not angry with you, but that he wants you to trust in his love. And he wants you cheerfully to walk with him as Noah did. God wants you to eat his son's holy body and to be assured that you are enfolded in God's eternal grace, covered with his ample, all-sufficient forgiveness. Dear friends in Christ, if you've ever wished that God would communicate his will to you with a sign, look no farther. Look no farther than the rainbow. Look no farther than the water of your baptism. Look no farther than the wine and the bread of his supper, his blood, his body. These signs tell you that God is surely gracious toward you. They call you to run to God daily, however far you've strayed from him, to confess your sin to him, to know him as a loving, forgiving father. These signs tell you that your sins are forgiven you because of the Son of God who went to the cross for you. Once more to our chancel windows. There's something else I haven't yet mentioned, and it's the cross front and center, white and lifted high. Did you ever notice that each of the two shields has a white bar, a white line passing through it? To me, this seems to signify that it is the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross that is the foundation of the saving power in the sacraments for all who believe. The cross, you know, is the ultimate sign of God's mercy, the sign of your redemption. Not just you, but me and all the world. It's true for all who attend our school, all who enter this church, or all who drive or walk past either one. In the sign of the cross, we see God's pledge to all humanity that our guilt has been fully paid for. And it's been accounted for by the only one who could do it, the Holy Son of God. And it's the proof and the promise that we shall stand innocent at our Savior's side when the last terrible day of judgment comes. We shall stand innocent there with all those whose faith is in Jesus Christ. Glory be to God for all the beautiful signs of his mercy. Amen. Peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our faith. Please stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. You rule earth and sea and sky. We give you thanks for the blessings of creation and life that come from your abundant goodness. Give to your church boldness to speak of your awesome deeds and to sing always of your righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, you are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Be glorified in your church and in Christ Jesus. Ground us in love. Give us a faith rooted in the promises of Christ and give us strength to comprehend with all the saints his love that surpasses knowledge. Grant all wisdom and godly discernment to Pastor Colin Dooling as he considers the calls 
he has to our Savior in Los Angeles, California, and also to our Trinity congregation, and enable all of us at both congregations to trust with quiet hearts in your provision and in your timing. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, as you preserved Noah and his family and brought forth new life from the ark under the promise of your covenant, bless now our families also. Make marriages strong and fruitful according to your will. Let your word rule in every home, uniting its members in forgiveness and causing your son to dwell in every heart through faith. Bless the ministry of Camp Iodesica and Trinity Lutheran School as we prepare for a new school year. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of might, spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessing to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces, police, and other public servants. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, through your Son and his reconciling death, we receive all good gifts, healing, and sustenance. We bring before you the sick and those in need, especially Frank Blair, Robin Brown, Judy Bush, Dorothy Campbell, Joe Gluba, Don Hudson, Barb Keenis, Charlene Meske, Brianna Renfro, Harlan Renfro, Sue Smith, Carol Stellwagen, Butch Wilkie, and Marilyn and Floyd Shipman. Give them healing and protection and encourage them in the midst of this life by the recognition of your fatherly providence known in Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, do not allow our hearts to become hardened by indifference or any frustration in this world. Give us understanding and courage to sustain us in this valley of sorrows. Lead us to your blessed sacrament with repentance and faith that eating your true body and drinking your blood, we may receive forgiveness of sins and confidence according to Christ's New Testament. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. Please stand, we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.